Nigerian President Mamadou Buhari suspends the nation's top judge, triggering controversy ahead of the upcoming presidential election. Malawian farmers turn to cannabis to supplement their lost tobacco earnings. And an unusual sailing vessel navigates the Kenyan coast to highlight the country's waste crisis. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories in a moment, but first we begin with the ongoing unrest in Sudan. During a visit to Egypt on Sunday, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir said that protesters in the East African nation are trying to imitate the Arab Spring anti-government uh, uprisings and rebellions that swept across North Africa and shook parts of the Middle East in 2011. President Bashir is facing the most sustained challenge since he rose to power in a 1989 coup. Demonstrators have turned out almost daily across the country to call for an end to his rule. While Bashir was in Cairo, his second foreign visit since unrest began on December 19th, a new demonstration erupted in Khartoum as men, women and children rallied against the government. Speaking next to his Egyptian president, uh, uh, Egyptian president rather, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, Bashir blamed and named harmful organizations for working to destabilize the region. The Nigerian government warns that it will not accept any foreign meddling after the European Union, United States and Britain raised concerns over Friday's suspension of Nigeria's most senior judge ahead of the February 16th presidential election. President Mohamed Buhari, who is seeking a second term in office, suspended Chief Justice Walter Onagen over allegedly breaching asset declaration rules. The suspension drew quick criticism at home and abroad. Nigeria's main opposition, People's Democratic Party, called it an act of dictatorship and halted its election campaign for 72 hours in protest. The EU election observation team says on again suspension is raising concerns about the opportunity for electoral justice. Nigeria's judiciary has helped resolve electoral dispute following previous votes, some of which have been marred by violence and allegations of vote rigging. The Chief Justice of Nigeria could rule on any future dispute. In its statement rebuking outside interference, Nigeria said it would reject any interference or perception uh, management that promotes apprehension about the outcome of its upcoming presidential election. The Kenyan authorities say they are taking steps to cut the number of weapons in civilian hands in an effort to combat crime. Together with civil society organizations, the government has launched a disarmament awareness campaign to convince those with illegal firearms to surrender the weapons in exchange for amnesty. Rylan Wall reports from Nairobi. Julius Kamande knows firsthand how violent life can be in Kenya's informal settlements. He grew up in one called Kemaiko and was himself involved in criminal activity at one point. Kamande says the government's program to get people to exchange illegal firearms for amnesty will probably save lives, but he believes people who live in informal settlements will feel less secure. I do not believe that you take the firearm to the police station and be safe. Even if they take it to a politician, I do not think they will be safe. There is already a perception that people have about you when you come out to surrender the firearm. The police will want to know more. Some return and we hear that they have been earmarked. The three-month campaign began in mid-December. People with illegal firearms are expected to surrender them at police stations or to political, community and religious leaders. The Regional Center on Small Arms and Light Weapons is one of the groups partnering with the government on the program. The objective is to have a baseline on uh, disarmament initiatives that work away from force, a voluntary civilian disarmament that can, be, can work well without force. A 2012 study by gun groups estimated there are more than 500,000 illegal guns in Kenya. But a lack of trust between Kenya police and some community, especially informal settlements, may hinder efforts to reduce the number of illegal weapons. The Social Justice Working Group, a consortium of social justice centers working in informal settlements, say police carried out at least 803 extrajudicial killings between 2013 and 2015. The group says it compiled this figure from documented deaths reported in the media during the period. 
the government has vowed to work with communities to reduce tensions. The most affected age bracket is between 15 and 35. And therefore engaging the youth, talking to them in a language they appreciate, is one of the strategies. It is an expansion of community policing, but with more facets, with a wider scope, so that the youth themselves are used to ensure that crime goes down. The effect of small arms availability and misuse continue to be felt throughout Kenyan society despite government mitigation efforts. The Kenyan government continues to conduct disarmament drives on an annual basis. Rael Lombor for VOA News, Nairobi. In South now, Malawi is the latest African country to look at legalizing cannabis, the plant that reduces, uh, produces hemp and marijuana after similar moves in Lesotho, South Africa and Zimbabwe. As Malawi's tobacco industry, the country's biggest foreign exchange earner has dwindled due to anti-tobacco campaigns. Farmers are now looking to grow cannabis. Uh, Lamek Messina reports from Lilongwe. Malawi has long relied on tobacco, which accounts for 13% of its gross domestic product and 60% of its foreign exchange earnings. But as tobacco prices per kilogram have fallen, Farmers like Phineas Chimombo have struggled. In most cases, farmers like us who are already poor, who struggle to find money to transport our tobacco to the market, sell our tobacco as low as 50 cents per kilogram. Health campaigners have eaten into tobacco profits, so farmers like Chimombo are looking for cannabis, the plant that produces marijuana and hemp. Once one grows hemp, just a small portion of it fetches more money than one can get from any crops a farmer can grow. Malawi is joining African nations, Lesotho, South Africa and Zimbabwe in looking to legalize cannabis after years of debate. In March, legislators will consider a bill on legalizing medical marijuana and hemp products. We are the first in, in this part of Africa to start discussing this thing. Those countries who came after us have gone ahead of us. They have already started issuing licenses. Malawi's anti-drug campaigners while legalizing medical marijuana will encourage more recreational use. And because local marijuana is commonly cultivated, commonly used in the country, then this one is legalized. It's like they are telling young people to use the local marijuana. So that's what we are fearing. But the supporters of legalizing cannabis seem to have won the debate that it is better to regulate the trade and help Malawi's economy to grow. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Lilongwe. Well, I want to know what uh, you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorey. Still ahead on Africa 54, U.S. federal employees return to work as the border wall battle persists right after this. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor, and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward.
Voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about, sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and Hadiza Kiari, and Ayan Bior, and Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. The longest government shutdown in U.S. history ended Friday when President Donald Trump delayed his demand for funding for a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border, signing a three-week spending bill that will reopen shuttered agencies and get back pay to 800,000 federal workers. But as VOA's congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson reports, the short-term funding is meant to buy lawmakers time to address border security. Air travel delayed along the east coast of the United States as unpaid air traffic controllers call out from work. The same day a second paycheck is missed by federal employees On after vote, two failed attempts in the U.S. One. Senate to reopen the government. That was the critical mass needed to move President Trump to reopen the government through February 15th, but without border wall funding. Over the next 21 days, I expect that both Democrats and Republicans will operate in good faith. This is an opportunity for all parties to work together for the benefit of our whole beautiful, wonderful nation. 21 days for federal employees to get paid and for lawmakers to negotiate a border security deal, the president was clear must still include that wall. The walls we are building are not medieval walls. They are smart walls. We do not need 2,000 miles of concrete wall from sea to shiny sea. We never did. We never proposed that. Trump's agreement to reopen the government to discuss border security was the demand from Democrats throughout the history-making 36-day standoff. The American people do not like it when you throw a wrench into the, into the lives of government workers over an unrelated political dispute. Hopefully now the president has learned his lesson. They Republican leadership called for president. Democrats to honor those demands. I hope our Democratic friends will stay true to the commitment they've stated constantly over the past weeks, that once the government was reopened, they'd be perfectly willing to negotiate in good faith on a full year of government funding that would include a significant investment in urgently needed border security measures, including physical barriers. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made it clear Democrats' essential position against funding a wall has not changed. But our unity is our power, and that is what maybe the president underestimated. Trump weighed declaring a national emergency at the border to obtain the funds for a wall. He later warned that was still a possibility if negotiations don't work out. We're going to work with the Democrats, we're going to see. Uh, and if we can't do that, then we'll do, uh, obviously, we're going to do the emergency, because that's what it is. It's a national emergency. A sign progress on the ongoing immigration debate is only temporary. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. But for deeper insight into what leads to a partial or full government shutdown and its implications, I'm joined by VOA National Correspondent Jim Malone. Welcome back, uh, Jim. Thanks, Vincent. So let's uh, start with the beginning hmm. of what actually leads to a shutdown, partial or full. Right. In this case, uh, government agencies were not funded. This is about a third of the government. So it was 800,000 federal workers. Uh, I don't know what your experience coming into work today was, but I can tell you I could feel a different energy in the subway as we saw a flood of workers returning to the job here after the longest shutdown in U.S. history. It was 35 days uh, before the president backed down. Yes. Now, all over the world, people watch this, they get a little confused because this is the only country where there's a government shutdown. What is the history? 
Well, the history is that you go back to the 80s and 90s, particularly during Bill Clinton's presidency, uh, the Republicans at times forced the shutdown for various periods of time uh, to try to get their way on legislation. I think the interesting thing this time about what uh, the Trump administration did was they chose a time right after Republicans had lost 40 seats in congressional elections last November uh, to try to flex their muscles. And as the president found out, if the Democrats stay unified, uh, this is a very difficult thing to do, and it changes how government will operate from here on in. We are in a divided government situation, which means one party cannot dictate to the other what's going to happen. But one party had the opportunity to do that last year. Was there any clear explanation as to why the Republicans did not push, push this through? Well, it's a good question. The Republicans were focused on things like getting their big tax cut through. That seemed to take most of the energy. The focus on the wall is important for President Trump. This was his signature campaign issue. This is what motivates a lot of his supporters. But if you look at the national polls, it's just slightly over 40 percent of voters are in favor of building the wall. Uh, well over 50 percent are against it. So it's not the strongest position on which to fight, uh, particularly if you're shutting down the government for a month. Yeah. Now, for some out there, they may see this as a, a free vacation for federal employees. Is it really so? Well, not really, because what we found out was a lot of people were kind of on the edge financially. A lot of people in this country are working paycheck to paycheck, month to month. So once that uh, pay was cut for a month, uh, they were actually looking to get other jobs, other opportunities. It put a lot of stress on the system. Uh, Catherine's piece noted the air traffic control issue. Once you get into possibly endangering the public, the debate takes a different turn. I think the president looked at his plummeting poll numbers and the issues about safety to do with the government safety net, and it changed the dynamics of this debate in a very big hurry. So after the staring uh, game, uh, eventually somebody blinks thereafter. What could be the consequences, whether intended or not? Well, I think the consequences here could be somewhat significant politically. I think the president has a weaker hand now. They are talking about the possibility of another shutdown if they don't get an agreement within three weeks on border wall funding. But we've seen how that worked out, and it was a disaster for him politically. So the more likely route may be this declaration of a national emergency, but even some Republicans, members of his own party, are warning against that because they believe it would set a bad precedent for what may come for a future Democratic president to also take executive power into his or her own hands. Indulge us a little bit on what really leads to a declaration of a national emergency. Well, the president could declare it through sort of executive action. Uh, he would basically be trying to bypass the Congress. Uh, there's a thought here they would take money from the defense department to try to have the wall built but this is subject to court challenges and as we know if that happens here that can extend this battle for months if not years so it could be a sidelining for now of this whole battle over the border wall the president sees it though as such a key issue for his re-election next year that he wants to be seen to be fighting for it, no matter how long the odds may get. Uh, but there is a, a kind of a leeway the president has in the Constitution to determine what is a national emergency, right? Yes, but he can be checked by the courts. So uh, presidents have done this in the past, but the question is, is it on this scale and how much money will be spent, and does he have the right to do it to bypass congressional appropriations? Thank you very much, Jim, for sure. making things Thank a you, bit Vincent. more clear there for us. Okay. Well, that's uh, the U.S. national correspondent, Jim Malone. The Venezuela's embattled leader, Nicolas Maduro, is rejecting a European Union ultimatum calling for new elections in his country. In a televised interview aired on Sunday, he said the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, has violated the Constitution by proclaiming himself interim president. But he has agreed to a dialogue with the opposition. His view is Zlatan Zahok. In an interview with CNN Turkey, which aired Sunday, Maduro said the country's high court and judiciary authorities will determine if Guaido violated Venezuela's laws. He rejected the demand by the European Union to hold a new and democratic election 
or else Europe will recognize Guaido as Venezuela's interim president. Venezuela will continue on its path. Fortunately, we don't depend on Europe and those arrogant, overbearing attitudes looking down on us because we are inferior to them. That European elite is finished with. That European elite doesn't represent the European people. The leaders of Europe are sycophants, kneeling behind the policies of Donald Trump. All of Europe is kneeling at the feet of U.S. President Donald Trump. It's as simple as that, and especially over Venezuela. President Maduro was sworn in for a second term earlier this month after an election widely considered as fraudulent. The United States and most regional countries, as well as Israel, have recognized Guaido as interim president until a new one is elected by a democratic vote. Maduro has cut diplomatic ties with Washington and ordered U.S. diplomats to leave the country, but has later rescinded that order. I have sent many messages to Mr. Trump, but I think he is drowning in domestic problems. And I think that he, I think, looks down on us. He looks down on all of Latin America and the Caribbean. The United States has warned Maduro against using force to quell the opposition or attack U.S. diplomatic personnel. Russia has accused the United States of fomenting unrest in Venezuela. The United States is painting a picture of a confrontation between the Maduro regime and the people of Venezuela. This picture is far from reality. In spite of everything, the leader of Venezuela obviously has broad support among the people. The United Nations called for a dialogue as a solution to the political crisis, but Venezuelans are divided on the issue. As Venezuelans, I think we should not be violent. I think that a dialogue will help us to move forward as Venezuelans, as a society, and a country that we are. First, how many times has there been dialogue and the government, or what is called the government, has not respected the dialogue? Are we going to do the same again? No. Here, there is no chance of dialogue. Maduro has the backing of Venezuela's military, but his military attaché in Washington on Saturday urged members of Venezuela's armed forces to recognize Guaido as the legitimate interim president. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Welcome back to Africa 54. And here's what's trending. A traditional Dow sailing boat uh, made entirely of trash has been launched on an expedition along the Kenyan coast to raise awareness about the harmful effects of plastic waste. The flip floppy set off from the coastal town of Watamu for the fourth leg of a 500 kilometer expedition that began on Lamu Island and is set to finish in Zanzibar. The boat is made of 10 tons of shredded plastic waste molded and compacted to form the hull, keel and ribs with only the mast made out of wood. It is covered in a brightly colored patchwork of 30,000 flip-flops, which like the rest of the raw materials, uh, was collected from Kenyan beaches and towns. Next up, uh, blockchain technology is better known as the driver of cryptocurrency Bitcoin, but now a U.S. coffee importer is using it to improve the lives of coffee farmers and some of the poorest communities in Central America. Thanks to blockchain and two brothers with a social conscience, uh, coffee growers uh, get a premium price selling directly to an independent coffee roaster in the United States instead of relying on the international coffee futures market. Coffee prices have been stuck in a slump for a decade since the global recession of 2008 with many growers being paid less than it costs to produce the crop. Blockchain technology creates a ledger to record, manage and confirm transactions uh, transparently and verifiably by all stakeholders from growers to importer to roaster. And that's what's trending today. It's especially difficult for persons with disabilities to find opportunities to develop skills and make a living. But a program in the U.S. Capitol is helping artists with special needs get the kind of training they need to develop their skills and earn a living. Viewers Randy Wikaksana tells us more about the nonprofit group Art Enables and the people it helps. Every week, Mina Mahmoudi helps her son paint. 
It's part of Feyman Yazini's life after a terrible accident years ago. Actually, my son, uh, Feyman, he was involved in car accident and his uh, traumatic brain injury at 13, which impaired his uh, mobility and uh, speech. So we were looking for a program because his interest was in art and uh, because he cannot use, or he only can use one hand with the left. Mina introduced painting to payment through Art Enables. As published in 2001, Art Enables provides adults with special needs the skills to become professional artists. So Art Enables provides a comprehensive, supportive vocational environment for individuals to be able to develop as artists and pursue careers in the arts. So there's sort of three parts to our model. The first part is our studio arts program, which allows our artists to come into a professional studio space to make, create, experiment, and to really develop their artistic viewpoint and to be able to develop their work. We also have a gallery and exhibitions program where we promote and represent the artists through exhibition and sale opportunities. Artists over 18 years old who experience a broad range of developmental and cognitive disabilities as well as mental health challenges may join the program. Their work is so impressive. Some of the artwork has sold for hundreds of dollars. And this one is payments show his heart. Look at my beautiful heart. And it shows, you know, his beautiful world inside, you know. Tony says each artist uses their creative time here as a way of communicating their thoughts, feelings and aspirations. This piece is by one of our long-term artists, Vanessa Monroe, and Vanessa often will say she travels the world through her artwork. So a lot of her artwork reflects a lot of international uh, imagery and traditions and styles and it's really profound and beautiful. And for some, it provides some source of income that may not otherwise be available. A key element of the program, since U.S. government figures show that last year, just 20% of those with special needs had access to employment. Randy Wichaksana, VOA News, Washington. Well, and that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight. And in the morning, today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That's Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night.